Welcome to the latest MS Hear From the Experts webinar. This series is helping people better understand multiple sclerosis, highlights MS related resources, plus provides tools and tips to navigate their MS journey with more knowledge and confidence. Our intention is to help learn more about the disease, treatments, research, wellness strategies, our programs, and much more. I am Lori Murphy, MS Canada staff and lead for the education team. I'd like to welcome both our Zoom and Facebook Live audiences to the broadcast. Today, we are sharing previously recorded content from our research team, which highlights our 2023 research priorities and impact. The webinar recording will be available from our website's archived webinars page in a couple of weeks and our, on our Facebook Live likely tomorrow. We will not have a question period following the broadcast of the video and encourage you to direct any questions you may have to our email, which is education at mscanada.ca. Now to the video with Pamela Canellis, the Assistant Vice President of MS Canada's research team. Hello everybody, my name is Dr. Pamela Canellis. I'm the AVP of Research at MS Canada, and today I'll be providing an overview of MS research. So in today's presentation, I'll be providing a bit of background, what's new in MS research, and also be providing you access to research resources so that you can keep up to date on the MS research. So just to start, I'll be providing a bit of background information and context. So it's estimated today that globally, uh, there are 2.8 million people living with MS. And this, based on our knowledge, this varies across the world and by region. We do know that Canada has a very high rate of MS, so high prevalence of MS with over 90,000 people living with MS in Canada. This translates into one in 400 people living with MS. Um, on, on average, 12 Canadians are diagnosed with MS every day. Of those people, we know that women are three times more likely to be diagnosed with MS, and they represent three quarters of the people living with MS. So what is MS? Well, we know that MS is, is certainly an immune-mediated disease, and it's uh, and affects the central nervous system. And the central nervous system includes your brain, spinal cord, and optic nerve. And MS can be progressive. In MS, the immune system inappropriately recognizes and attacks myelin. And myelin is that coating or protective cover that surrounds nerve fibers. Uh, damage to this myelin ca can cause inflammation and damage and resulting in disruptions to the nerve signals uh, from within these nerve fibers. And these nerve fibers run from the brain to the rest of the body. And so these disruptions can result in a number of MS symptoms. So MS can affect one's vision, mood, cognition, balance, coordination, and mobility. And, and every individual varies in terms of their MS, so they may be affected differently across all of these symptoms. While we do not yet have a cure for MS or ways to prevent MS, there are certainly treatments available to modify the disease course and manage symptoms. So over the last 30 years, we have made remarkable improvements in the development of therapies. Currently, there are 19 disease modifying therapies that have been approved by Health Canada. But in terms of treatment and care for MS, while we've come a long way, we know that there's more to do. So at MS Canada, our vision is a world free of MS, and our mission is to connect and empower the MS community to create positive change. And to achieve this vision and mission, we're centered on our impact goals, and we have four of these impact goals. The first is understand and halt disease progression. So this is understanding the complexities of MS progression to stop MS in its tracks. The second is centered on advanced treatment and care, having a variety of effective treatment and care options for overall disease management, including symptom management, wellness, and self-care to help people across their own unique MS journey. And thirdly, stopping MS before it starts to reduce the number of people who ultimately develop MS. 
And finally, enhance well-being, removing the physical and social barriers within communities to ensure access to opportunities and supports for people affected by MS. People affected by MS are at the center of what of everything that we do. Through a consultation and engagement of key stakeholders, MS Canada has defined key research priority areas. And these include the causes and risk factors of MS, to figure out how to repair and support remyelination uh, in people living with MS, to understand progression and progressive MS, uh, cognition and mental health, life modifying therapies, and diagnosis. So these are the research priorities that we've been defined. MS Canada provided its first research grant in 1948. And since that time, we've provided over $218 million for MS research. Annually, we invest five to $10 million annually in grants, awards, and education and training. And thanks to this support, Canada has cultivated a network of exceptional MS, research, MS researchers who have become leading contributors to discovery research in the field of MS. And while we've made enormous progress to date, there still remain significant questions that we need to address with understanding the causes of MS, its potential prevention, and the need for improved treatment and care, including those that support repair and regeneration. MS Canada supports research across the continuum of research activities. So we support foundational or basic research to understand the disease causes and processes of MS, which we still don't yet fully understand. We also take those findings and translate them to develop new MS treatments and support research that tests those treatments in clinical research in people uh, with the disease. And so this is inclusive of understanding the biological mechanisms of MS, um, developing models so we can better study that MS and its processes and mechanisms, um, developing better brain imaging to support diagnosis and management of the disease, identifying new biomarkers and drug discovery, and ultimately supporting um, treatments in people. So doing clinical trials, improving quality of life, managing symptoms better, um, and uh, other rehabilitative strategies. We also know that uh, while we uh, alone can't do this alone um, and that we that collaboration is really the key to creating a larger impact, MS Canada is a founding and managing member of the International Progressive MS Alliance, or I'll refer to it as the Alliance. And the Alliance is this unprecedented global collaboration of MS organizations bringing together the pharmaceutical industry, foundation, donors, researchers, healthcare professionals, and people affected by MS who are all working together to tackle the challenge of progressive MS. And together, our vision is to end MS progression and accelerate the development of effective treatments for people with progressive MS and mobilize all of these stakeholders uh, towards this one goal, as well as improving the quality of life worldwide for people with progressive MS. The Alliance has three strategic priority areas to understand and prevent and reverse progression, to speed up and improve clinical trials, and improve the well-being through proven therapeutic approaches. We also work in talking to our global partners, we understand there's alignment in our research strategies and goals. And so there's, for instance, there's much alignment between MS Canada impact goals and our neighboring partner, the National MS Society in the US, who have defined uh, their research roadmap uh, as pathways to cures through three areas of stop, restore, and end MS, and see opportunities for global collaboration. And so using, uh, thinking about all of our strategies uh, we're committed to working with global partners like NMSS, but also from other organizations around the world. And over and in terms of pathways to cures in MS, over 30 leading MS organizations across the globe have, have endorsed this strategy. And so um, a group of these organizations um, from the US, UK, Australia, Italy, among other MS organizational countries, organizations from different countries have come together to form a global research strategy group and talk about how we can achieve these goals together. And so uh, we're looking to, uh, we've agreed on particular next steps to make an impact in this area. And so what we want to do working together to understand 
uh, the global MS research funding landscape to be able to share our national plans and strategies and identify areas where we think there could be value in collaboration and making a larger impact to align our resources for that collaboration and to support collaboration collaborations to address those gaps and report on our progress together. And we want ideas to come from, the ideas can come from anywhere in the world, uh, and we want them to maximize those ideas, the best ideas, uh, and work together to achieve them for people living with MS. So in the next part of my talk, I just wanted to share uh, what's new in MS research and to provide some of the insight around uh, what's happening not only in Canada, but globally. And I'll uh, organize this discussion through our impact goal areas. So in terms of the first impact goal is understand and halt disease progression. So MS Canada, in partnership with Brain Canada Foundation, Biogen Roche, and the Government of Alberta, are supporting the Canadian Perspective Cohort to study to understand progression in MS. So we refer to this study as CanProCo for short. CanProCo is investigating the factors that are associated with MS progression. And the hope, and we really want to understand progression fully, not only when it starts, so the onset of progression, but also the rate of progression. And what are the factors that influence these two things? So the outcomes of the study are important because we'll be able to make better predictions on how certain individuals are likely to experience their MS over time. And there's huge variation in how a person living with MS experiences progression. So we really don't understand why some people progress more slowly or rapidly than others. Um, and so this will allow us to develop more targeted and appropriate care strategies uh, based on a better understanding of these factors. So this study, um, is uh, has already uh, recruited over 800 participants at five sites across Canada, so including Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, Edmonton, and Calgary, and is following people over a five-year period. So it's a longitudinal perspective cohort study so that we can collect data on people over time to follow and identify factors related to progression. This involves over 50 researchers of, involved in this collaborative effort, and it's led by Dr. G1 O at St. Michael's Hospital hospital at the, uh, at the University of Toronto. The CanProCo is really centered on three research pillars um, and bringing multidisciplinary researchers together in this way. Um, so the first pillar is centered on health outcomes or epidemiology, understanding at a population level uh, and clinical data um, and integrating that data together. The second pillar is focused on neuroimaging or using MRI uh, to understand what's happening at the at the at the brain, the structural level, and then neuroimmunology, understanding what's happening at the cellular level. So at the single cell, um, and taking blood samples and analyzing uh, biological samples to understand. So each of these pillars will offer something in terms of understanding the factors alone. Uh, and the power of CamproCo is not only doing that, but also then integrating those factors across all three pillars so that the interactions and associations between these factors could be understood in terms of progression. So the potential here is that with this knowledge, we can improve diagnosis, prediction, disease monitoring, and understand better understand treatment response and have an impact. To date, CamproCo has uh, 838 participants that are actively enrolled and thankfully contributing their data uh, in this study on a yearly basis through follow-up visits. The researchers are also um, already contributing research studies, um, are already contributing and publishing research results based on, on CamproCo and its activities. Um, early research publications have been centered around understanding the health economics of MS, so understanding the effect of MS on employment status and productivity, the effect of those who are employed even at the earliest phases of diagnosis of MS having an effect on presenteeism, uh, those who are, are unemployed having issues related to 70% uh, report health-related issues uh, related to their unemployment um, dealing with MS symptoms. There's also an understanding using BC data to understand the direct healthcare costs associated with MS and the excess costs that are driven by medication costs. 
Also, additionally, at a population level, understanding cancer risk in MS, so those taking disease-modifying therapies and looking at the population in Alberta um, to understand cancer risk, identifying that the um, the risk was, was they found similar uh, to the general population in those uh, with MS. So these publications are emerging and we have more data on our website emerging from these studies. In addition to Cambroco, there's other pieces in development of understanding progression. So in this year, researchers identified the first genetic variant or factor that's associated with disease severity in MS. So the genetic variant has a complicated name, uh, RS, based on its location in the genome. And they found it's associated with a long-term health outcomes and MS progression. And so what they found is if you had this genetic variant, it increased your risk of disability progression uh, by almost four years. So it took people, uh, it increased their risk to reach EDSS 6 in a shorter period of time than others. So knowing this kind of information helps us in identifying potential pathways that could be therapeutic targets. So drugs could be developed to target these pathways. So if we I now are identifying genes related to disease severity. This study in particular also identified lifestyle factors that may influence progression. So what they found is that higher levels of education were associated with, with lower risk of disability progression. So if, if one had higher levels of education, they had a slower uh, risk or they had less disability progression over time. On in the contrary, if you were a smoker, smoking was associated with faster rates of progression. Uh, and this has been seen in a number of other studies. What's always observed is if one quits smoking, the benefits of quitting can be seen in terms of progression as well. This study did not find an effect on vitamin D or body mass index on disability progression. So in terms of preventing MS, uh, MS is believed to be caused by a number of, of a combination of genes and lifestyle or environmental factors that influence the risk of MS. In terms of genetics, it's a complicated story because what they found in looking at tens of thousands of people with MS, comparing them to healthy controls, is that there's over 200 genetic variants that are associated with the susceptibility or the risk of getting MS. Um, what's important is that this, this knowledge advances our understanding on the causes of MS, the molecular events that lead to disease onset, and potential targets for prevention. And what they found in, in a number of those genes that were identified are genetic variants is that they're associated with the immune system, which, which does make sense in terms of the causes or risk factors of MS. Researchers have also identified a number of environmental or lifestyle risk factors for MS. So as I mentioned before, smoking is also a risk factor for getting MS or increasing your risk of getting MS. Insufficient sun ex exposure or low vitamin D levels have been, have been identified, as well as adolescent obesity and Epstein-Barr vi virus infection. So for the next few slides, I'm gonna focus on Epstein-Barr virus infection, which has been a hot topic of discussion in this field to provide more context. So what is Epstein-Barr virus, which is a, a mouthful, so I'll refer to it as EBV. So EBV is a very common virus. It's part of the human herpes virus family, and it infects over 95% of people in the population over a lifetime during their lifespan. It typically people get infected in childhood or adolescence. Um, and uh, infection is transmitted through saliva. It's a very common tra transmissible disease, and it can lead to what we call infectious mononucleosis, or more commonly, mono. Um, EBV is a type of virus that once you get it, it integrates itself into your genome. It actually lives in your B cells, which is an immune system cell, and it, it's with you for the rest of your life, uh, for the most part. It mostly stays, we'll say, dormant or asleep, and it's not active, but there are times that it becomes active. Um, so Epstein-Barr virus has long been known as a risk factor for MS, but the complicated story here is that most of us have it, but most of us do not have MS. So this has been a complicated story. What actually shed a little bit more light on this story in terms of a risk factor was a recent study from 2022 it's a landmark study you may have heard about that examined a cohort of 10 million military personnel over a 20-year period to understand the role of EBV and MS. 
And what they found is that EBV is an early and initial trigger of MS. So what they did to find that is they looked at 800 people with MS over this very long period and a lot of data and found that almost all of those 800 people, except for one, were, had been infected by EBV. So it seemed to be required to get MS. Then they looked at another subset of a population that didn't have EBV when they joined the military, when they enrolled, but ultimately ended up diagnosed with MS. And then they were able to follow them over time. And what they found was that in, in all of those cases, except one, uh, people were infected by EBV. They found evidence of, of uh, nerve fiber damage. And then they found the person was diagnosed uh, with MS. And that sequence and order was consistent for, for all of the third, for the 34 cases out of 35. And so what this said is that EBV infection was an early and necessary initial trigger of MS um, that, that is required as part of the causes of MS and found that this was a, provided a 32 fold increase in risk of MS for those infected by EBV. So this research has really stimulated more activity in this space and thinking about how might we prevent MS knowing this. Um, so if we use this, uh, this cartoon as the example, we can think of all of the risk factors as dominoes. And if you have more than one of these risk factors, that might increase your risk to knocking all of the dominoes over and ultimately being diagnosed with MS. But if you had a way to prevent EBV, so viruses can be prevented through vaccines or other approaches and other therapeutics. Um, so if you had an EBV vaccine, for example, could you remove that initial and early trigger of MS and potentially um, not lead to MS diagnosis? So this is the intriguing piece of where we are and um, I think exciting as well. So while EBV is a risk factor for MS, it's also a risk factor for other autoimmune diseases and, and some cancers. And there are a number of global efforts now centered on uh, developing EBV vaccines. So the US government through the National Institutes of Health is developing an EBV vaccine candidates that are currently in phase one testing. Moderna has developed an mRNA vaccine candidate that's in, currently in tested in phase one and Moderna was basically developed itself through the pandemic and became quite well known and developed its mRNA vaccine technology. And there are other efforts around the world, including uh, spinoff companies and research institutes that have various types of EBV vaccines that might be effective in this case. And so the hope and potential is that these vaccines may reduce the uh, or prevent MS from happening or reduce the number of cases. MS can is also, we don't really under, while we know that it's an early and initial trigger of MS, we don't really understand the mechanisms of how this is working. Certainly there are a number of researchers investigating why and how this might be working. MS Canada is supporting researchers and helping to understand these mechanisms. And so we're supporting Dr. Dahlia Rothstein to understand um, who's using health administrative data, looking at the population level data to understand um, the timeline of EBV infection to getting mononucleosis to ultimately being diagnosed with MS and looking at the right timing of that and how that happens at a population level. And these types of study results will help to contribute to the development of diagnostics. So when do you, and therapeutic strategies. So when do you give a vaccine? When's the right timing of the vaccine? This research can help provide some insight Secondly, we're working in partnership with the NMSS and the MS organization in the US to support Dr. Mark Horwitz at the University of British Columbia, who's developing animal models that will help us better, better understand the mechanisms of how EBV contributes to MS disease initiation and progression. And secondly, to test different therapeutic strategies like a vaccine and other approaches to prevent or even remove the virus uh, from these animal models. And these types of this type of knowledge can help us as we move to humans and start testing different pieces. Another exciting area in the prevention space is the MS prodrome. So a prodrome has been seen in a number of neurological diseases. It's usually a set of early signs and symptoms indicating the start of a disease, 
but well before the clinical onset of, of symptoms. Um, Dr. Helen Tremlett from the University of British Columbia and her team um, are really leading this effort, and they've done a lot of work to identify an MS, pro, MS prodromal phase. So if you can see, if you look at this cartoon of MS, if MS symptoms uh, onset happen uh, at the bottom arrow, the prodromal phase is a period before one would be have an onset of traditional clinical MS symptoms. Um, it's certainly after one is at risk, and they, it's believed that underlying biological processes are already starting to happen, and people in this phase have a higher risk of converting and ultimately being diagnosed with MS. And this period could be five or 10 years before one would have onset of MS. And so emerging data identified this period as higher rates people showed in this space, um, higher rates of hospitalization, physician service use was increased, increased number of prescriptions, psychiatry and dermatology visits, people reported uh, IBS, pain, uh, headache and migraine, and these are just examples, but there's a number of nonspecific signs and symptoms that ultimately looking at population health data of people ultimately diagnosed with MS, so you can identify that there is something happening in that five or 10 year period. So it, there's certainly more work that needs to be done in this space to be able to identify individuals who are in this phase, this prodromal phase. But if we are able to identify these individuals within this phase who are the greatest risk of developing an MS, it may provide us with an earlier window to manage and prevent MS onset, which would be a phenomenal approach here. So in terms of... Um, the next section, I'd like to highlight some advances in treatment and care. So there's certainly a need, as I've, I've hopefully made a case, for more effective therapies. We certainly um, want therapies to reduce relapses, but we also want them to address that chronic inflammation that's involved in progressive disease. And we think that that is taking place in, compartmentalized, uh, in a comp compartmentalized way in the central nervous system. And so one class of, of new treatments that are being developed are called Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitors, or BTKs, or BTKIs, and they target Bruton's tyrosine kinases, which are um, a key enzyme found in several immune cells that have been linked to MS development and its processes. And so BTK inhibitors are also... Um, a high potential therapy because they can cross that blood brain barrier and get to the compartmentalized places where uh, we think that progression is taking place. Uh, this, uh, this slide shows that there are a number of BTKI inhibitors currently in clinical trials and they're in late stage clinical trials, uh, which is hopeful. Um, we did have disappointing news this week that evobrutinib, uh, one of these listed, uh, reported that it was not more effective at reducing relapses in the phase three clinical trial. Certainly, we're still learning more about um, the clinical trial results from that particular clinical trial and more outcomes are being analyzed and awaiting publication of that. Um, we will have to wait and see the results of these other BTKI candidates. There are certainly differences between them that may affect their effectiveness and the structure of these clinical trials in terms of the outcomes that they're looking at. So we're, we're waiting to see, but in the next six months to a year, we should have more information. We're also um, looking at ways to support uh, MS symptoms. And so cognitive dysfunction, an invisible symptom, affects 40 to 80% of people with MS. MS Canada funded an international multi-center clinical trial to investigate how to address cognitive, uh, cognitive dysfunction. And this trial, uh, this trial utilized cognitive rehabilitation and aerobic exercise as interventions to see whether if you combine those two, um, that they could be effective in addressing uh, cognition in people with MS. So this trial looked at either one, both or each of them 
uh, to see their effectiveness. And so they looked, this was one of the largest clinical trials in this space, looked at 311 participants, and they were assigned to four different treatment groups who were received the intervention twice per week over a 12 week period. So people either got both cognitive rehabilitation and aerobic exercise, they either got cognitive rehabilitation with a sham exercise, which was balance and stretching, but no aerobic activity, or they did aerobic exercise and a sham cognitive task, which was um, directed internet searching, for example, or a double sham. So they either got uh, the directed internet searching and um, balance and stretching exercises, so not aerobic exercise. And what they found from this uh, study was that the combined interventions of aerobic exercise and cognitive rehabilitation were not better than either intervention alone. In addition, these interventions were also not better than the sham, the double sham activities. And so this was an unexpected finding from this study. What is hopeful from this study was that two thirds of participants from all of the intervention groups I described showed significant improvements in processing speed uh, in their cognition. And that was at 12 weeks after the intervention and 50% of those people that showed improvement had kept these improvements over six months. So that was encouraging. Um, and the next steps and researchers believe that this improvement may be due to the fact that that sham uh, exercise um, uh, where people did balance and stretching, uh, they measured that people actually had walking improvements and these walking improvements may affect their cognition. So researchers are continuing to look at this data. The next steps are to better understand who is, uh, who would respond to treatments in cognition and, and to better design clinical trials uh, for future interventions in cognition. So the final category is enhanced well-being. So it's estimated that up to 75% of youth with MS experience depression, cognitive impairment, and, fit, and fatigue. So in partnership with NMSS, we are supporting a feasibility clinical trial led by Dr. Ann Ye at the Hospital for Sick Children and the University of Toronto to determine if exercise can improve health outcomes in youth with MS. So Ann Ye and team all will be also examining the underlying biological mechanisms for the benefits of exercise, looking at their uh, effect on memory, uh, protecting our, your nerve fibers and uh, other pieces like depression. And so the impact of this work is that this research could identify effective strategies or lead to clinical trials around strategies that address MS symptoms and improve health outcomes in youth with MS in, a very, in an accessible way with interventions like exercise. So this is an exciting group called the MS Can Rehab. So they're all uh, a team of multidisciplinary rehabilitation researchers and clinicians from across Canada. And they've come together to form a collaborative research network called MS Can Rehab. So they bring together multi areas of expertise, physiatry, neuropsychology, physical therapy, OT, exercise physiology, clinical epidemiology, and neuroscience. And by establishing this network together, MS Can Rehab aims to more quickly and efficiently develop and test novel approaches, therapies, and technologies to restore function in people living with MS. The team aids to lead large-scale multi-site clinical trials to advance discovery and transform the field of MS. And they're very excited to have come together and are starting to work together and um, access funding to do those trials. So the final part of my presentation, I'd like to highlight some research resources so that you can keep uh, in touch with the research, the ongoing research. So certainly there's opportunities to participate in research and also to learn about it. So the first part is that there are opportunities always to participate in research. So we fund studies, MS Canada, and people approach us and about research studies that have been approved through Research and Ethics Board. And uh, we, post, um, we post these studies through a research portal. And you can find links on our website to, to participate in MS research. And through the research portal, you can identify research studies that may be virtual in nature. So across Canada, you can participate or the world, 
or um, you may have to go in person locally. And each study will have defined eligibility criteria of, of, what can, of who can participate and what they're looking for. And so there's an opportunity where there may be studies that, that may be of interest to you that you wanna participate in. The other piece is that you can continue to learn about the research. And so there's multiple ways to do that. So for one, all of the research that MS Canada funds, you can find on our research studies we fund. And so you can find links to um, research studies we fund uh, and find opportunities to do that. And once you're there, there's a search uh, tool where you can search by the impact goals, areas of research. Uh, you can put in particular researcher names that you're interested. If you're interested in research in your province, you can look for geographic location or keywords in areas that you're interested to see if people are working on. And so then you can um, dive into them and look at not only this information, but see summaries of the research and what the potential impact of that research aims to be. You can also learn about MS researchers that we support. So we have profiles on the researchers that we support so you can learn about their research interests and areas of expertise, as well as an interview with the researchers to get to know them a little bit better. You can also learn about the latest in research um, through our website, create a link to the latest in research. Again, you can search things of interest, but this is where we post not only things that are happening in Canada, Canada, but globally around important research discoveries that are that are taking place. And so to keep you updated on the pieces that are happening around the world. And here we, in terms of the latest in research, um, this is intended to provide a summary, background, and, and some details on what was found, as well as the impact of that research. There's also opportunities to read the blog, and we have an MS Research uh, blog where you can learn more about what's taking place in MS Research. There are two uh, major MS Research conferences that take place every year. Actrums and Ectrums, and oft we write blogs on those two conferences, as well as an end of year summary on the advances from that year. We also have opportunities to sus subscribe to the Research in Action newsletter. So if you miss things and don't and, and happen to not see everything, you can sign up for our Research in Action newsletter, which is a quarterly update that synthesizes all of the activities within the last uh, quarter. And you can see here, this is an example of, of uh, a research in action in all of the topic areas that, that we cover to keep you updated. So this is my presentation for today. I thank you for your time and I hope it was informative and that, there, that you learned something from today. Thank you so much for your time.